Why is it that so many people fail in life? Self-improvement books are among the best-selling books in all the bookstores. Millions have read them, and yet the vast majority continue to live lives far below their potential, achieving far less than they're actually capable of. For years, I've studied success and failure, and I'm going to explain why people fail so you can be alert to these tendencies in yourself and others. Recognize the behaviors that lead to failure, and make a conscious effort to avoid them. Why do people fail? Economists say that the inability to delay gratification is a primary predictor of economic failure. In life, people fail because they do what is fun and easy rather than what is hard and necessary. Success and failure are more the result of habit than of anything else. Probably 90% or more of everything we do is dictated by habit, and once a habit, good or bad, is formed, we become comfortable with it and strive to remain consistent with what we're familiar with, even if our habits are leading to failure. Psychologists call this tendency to become comfortable, getting into our comfort zone, and even if our comfort zone is keeping us at a low level of performance, we stay in it rather than change. All change for the good in our lives begins by changing our thoughts and actions so that we form habits that assure our success and then make those habits our masters. The key is self-knowledge and self-awareness of why it is we feel, act, walk, and talk. When we study human action, we find that human beings, all of us, value leisure. So given a choice between an easier or harder way, we will always choose the easier way because the sooner we get the job done, the sooner we can enjoy leisure the sooner we can take it easy. Now, in this sense, we are all basically lazy. This is neither good nor bad. It is only what we do as a result of this laziness that is good or bad. All human progress in science and technology comes from the tendency for people to seek faster, easier ways to get the things that we want. So, in a certain sense, laziness is a motivator to human progress. My second characteristic of human nature is that we each try to get the very most for the very least expenditure of money or effort. In this sense, then, we are all greedy. This is neither good nor bad, just basic human nature. We are greedy in that we always want the very most for the very least, and we are never satisfied. And we are continually striving to get more and more. All of our lives, we are never ever really contented. The third characteristic is that each of us strives continually to improve the quality of our lives. We may not always succeed, but every action we take is an attempt to be better off than we would be without the action. In this sense, then, every human being is ambitious. So far, each of us is lazy, greedy, and ambitious. We may be ambitious for different things, and we may have more or less opportunity to realize our ambitions, but we are all ambitious. The fourth characteristic is that each person thinks, acts, feels, and experiences happiness or unhappiness by and for themselves. Everything we do, even charitable acts, we do because, in our personal opinion at that moment, it is the best thing for us as we see it. Selfishness, self-centeredness, is essential for survival and is neither good nor bad in itself. It just is a fact of human nature. The fifth characteristic of human nature is that, because no one in the world can possibly know everything there is to know about even one subject. We are all acting on the basis of incomplete information every time we act. In this sense, we are all ignorant. No matter how much we learn, we must still act with some uncertainty, some ignorance of the facts, often with great ignorance, sometimes complete ignorance. Finally, as human beings, we have an ego. We think very highly of ourselves. As every study shows, we consider ourselves to be superior to others in many ways, in terms of intelligence, personality, appearance, leadership ability, and so on. Another way to put this is that we are all vain. This is neither good nor bad, just a normal facet of human nature. We all want basically the same things, in this order of priority, although we want them with different degrees of intensity, and we settle for different levels of achievement in each of these areas. First of all, security. Security is number one. This is our basic need, the survival instinct. Security of life, limb, physical security, economic security, emotional security. We value security very, very highly. Any threat to our security in any area brings an immediate reaction to protect and defend. Lack of security makes us angry, fearful, and defensive. The second thing that we want is comfort. And this is what we go for once we've achieved what is to us an acceptable level of security. We seek comfort, especially physical comfort. We pay an enormous amount and work very hard to gain the comforts that we desire. The third thing, 
Once we have enough comfort and security, we want to relax. We want to take time off, we want leisure, and we want to put up our feet. Leisure is a valued good, and we work very hard and pay dearly for it. Holidays are leisure, golf is leisure, tennis is leisure. These are the leisure time activities in our societies. They consume hundreds of billions of dollars. Remember, we are all basically lazy. We like leisure, and we will pay very highly for it. Love is the fourth thing we all want. We seek the affection and the love of others. This is something we desire so intensely that we will even die for it. Each of us needs to be loved to feel fully human, and we strive for it all our lives. The fifth thing that we all want is respect. We need to be recognized and respected by others outside our family group. Because we are basically vain, we seek the praise and appreciation of other people. We will make great efforts to earn and keep the goodwill and respect of others towards us. Finally, the sixth thing that we want is fulfillment. Each of us has a deep inner craving for a sense of meaning and purpose in life. And here's the key point. The basic law of human nature is that people always tend to seek the fastest and easiest way to get the things they want, and usually to get the things they want right now. I call this the expediency factor, or the e-factor, and it explains why people succeed and why they fail. Families, corporations, organizations, and nations succeed and fail because of the unwillingness to delay gratification. As we spoke about earlier, the vast majority of people immediately act to get the things they want now, the fastest and easiest way, even if the long-term consequences of their actions will be underachievement and failure. Here are some common examples with which we're all familiar. A young man drops out of high school to take a job to buy a car to impress the girls. That's the expedient thing to do, and the long-term price is a lifetime of low wages and frustrating work. This is called short-term gain for long-term pain. Unions strike for higher than market wages at the long-term price of permanently crippling the industry and causing permanent unemployment for their members. A perfect example is Chrysler Corporation, which almost went bankrupt because of outsized wage settlements in previous years. Government employees increase their budgets and staff to inflate their salaries at the long-term price of huge government deficits, inflation, and economic recession. I'm convinced that most of our economic problems in society come from expecting people in government to act in our best interests when they're put into office. When the entire governmental system says that the bigger your area of responsibility, the higher your budget, the greater the number of staff you have, the more you get paid. So when push comes to shove, the government servant, by basic human nature, will opt to increase the size of his department in order to increase the size of his rewards. The pull of the e-factor is very strong. It causes the vast majority of men and women to indulge themselves at whim, to ignore the secondary long-term consequences of their actions, and by refusing to delay gratification, to engage in short-term pain for long-term gain. They condemn themselves to lives of frustration and disappointment. The e-factor explains most failure in adult life. Only those rare few men and women, less than 5% in each generation, who consciously master themselves and resist the gravitational pull of the e-factor, ever really succeed in the long term. The one human quality that must be developed for success is self-discipline. The willpower to force yourself to do what you know you should do, when you should do it, whether you like it or not, whether you feel like it or not. A famous study spanning 12 years concluded that successful people are simply those who make a habit of doing what unsuccessful people don't like to do. And what are the things that unsuccessful people don't like to do? They're the same things that successful people don't like to do, but successful people do it because they know that that is the price of success. It has been said that hard work, persistence, and focusing on clear, specific goals are the keys to success. That's true, but these are merely the outer expressions of self-discipline and action. Your key to success in life is to resolve to do what you know you should do, what other successful, self-disciplined people do, when you should do it, whether you feel like it or not. True self-esteem, the foundational quality of your success, comes from mastering yourself, resisting the temptation to take the fastest and easiest way, sticking to what you know to be right until you win through. This is the psychology, the mindset of success. Self-esteem requires self-discipline, and self-discipline builds self-esteem. What have we learned? The first thing that we've learned is that failure is as predictable as success. You must be aware of what failures do and don't do it. And since the great majority of men and women are going nowhere with their lives, 
You must be very careful to observe in your environment people who are going nowhere and don't do what they do. Don't read what failures read. Don't watch what failures watch on television. Don't spend your time the way failures spend their time. Success and failure are more the result of your habits than anything else. You must develop success habits and make them your masters. And you must learn those success habits from other successful people whose achievements you admire. Remember, and this is the key to understanding economics, marketing, and why things go wrong in our society, even with the best of intentions, it is that everyone is naturally, that means by nature, lazy, greedy, ambitious, selfish, ignorant, and vain. Now, this is neither good nor bad, it's just a fact of life. It is only the way people demonstrate these qualities that makes them either good or bad. It is always the actions, not the qualities themselves. We know also that everyone wants the same things. You and I, we all want the same things, though often with different degrees of intensity. We all seek security, comfort, leisure, love, respect, and fulfillment. The natural human tendency is to seek the fastest and easiest way to get the things we want right now, with little or no concern for the long-term consequences of our actions. And the tendency to seek the fastest and easiest way almost invariably leads us to engage in actions that cause us to fail in the long term. The ability to discipline yourself to delay gratification in the short term in order to enjoy greater rewards in the long term is the indispensable prerequisite for success. And finally, when you develop the habit of self-discipline, you free yourself from the e-factor. With self-discipline come the feelings of self-esteem, self-confidence, pride, and satisfaction that are the great treasures of the human experience. And one more point, one of the most important things I've ever learned, a philosophic point if you like. Your values, your true beliefs, are always expressed and only expressed in your actions. It is not what you say, and it is not what you intend, but what you do that signifies what you really believe. If you engage in the actions of successful people, if you practice the same principles and live by the same rules, you will eventually come to be exactly like them in your beliefs. We will look at the 10 vital principles of success, achievement, and peak performance. Living by these 10 principles will enable you to accomplish anything you really want in life. Music. Your ability and willingness to discipline yourself to accept personal responsibility for your life is essential to happiness, health, success, achievement, and personal leadership. Accepting responsibility is one of the hardest of all disciplines, but without it, no success is possible. The failure to accept responsibility and the attempt to foist responsibility for things in your life that make you unhappy onto other people, institutions, and situations completely distorts cause and effect undermines your character, weakens your resolve, and diminishes your humanity. It leads to making endless excuses. My great revelation came when I was 21, living in a tiny apartment and working as a construction laborer. I had to get up at 5 a.m. to take three buses to work. Arriving by 8 a.m. I didn't get home until 7 p.m., tired out from carrying construction materials all day. I was making just enough money to get by, had no car, almost no savings, and just enough clothes for my needs. I had no radio or television. It was in the middle of a cold winter with a temperature of minus 35 degrees Fahrenheit, so I seldom went out in the evening. Instead, if I had enough energy, I sat in my small apartment at my little table in my kitchen nook and read. One evening, late at night as I was sitting there by myself at the table, it suddenly dawned on me that this is my life. This life was not a rehearsal for something else. The game was on, and I was the main character, as in a play. It was like a flashbulb going off in my face. I looked at myself and around me at my small apartment and considered the fact that I had not graduated from high school. The only work that I was qualified to do was manual labor. I earned just enough money to pay my basic expenses and had very little left over at the end of the month. I suddenly knew that unless I changed, nothing else was going to change. No one else was going to do it for me. In reality, no one else really cared. I realized at that moment that from that day forward, I was completely responsible for my life and for everything that happened to me. I was responsible. I could no longer blame my situation on my difficult childhood or mistakes I had made in the past. I was in charge. I was in the driver's seat. This was my life, and if I didn't do something to change it, it would go on like this indefinitely by the simple force of inertia. This revelation changed my life. I was never the same again. From that moment on, I accepted more and more responsibility for everything in my life. 
I accepted responsibility for doing my job better than before rather than doing only the minimum that was necessary to avoid getting fired. I accepted responsibility for my finances, my health, and especially my future. The very next day, I went down to a local bookstore at my lunch break and began the lifelong practice of buying books with information, ideas, and lessons that could help me. I dedicated my life to self-improvement, to continuous learning in every way possible. For the rest of my business life, right up to the present moment, whenever I wanted or needed to learn something to help me, I have returned to learning through reading, listening to audio programs, and attending courses and seminars. I found that you could learn anything you need to learn in order to accomplish any goal you set for yourself. Over time, I learned that fully 80% of the population never accepts complete responsibility for their lives. They continually complain, criticize, make excuses, and blame other people for things in their lives about which they're not happy. The consequences of this way of thinking, however, can be disastrous. They can sabotage all hopes for success and happiness later in life. From childhood to maturity, when you are growing up from an early age, you become conditioned to see yourself as not responsible for your life. This is normal and natural. When you're a child, your parents are in charge. They make all your decisions. They decide what food you will eat, what clothes you will wear, what toys you will play with, what home you will live in, what school you'll attend, and what activities you'll engage in during your spare time. Because you are young, innocent, and unknowing, you do what they want you to do. You have little choice or control. As you grow up, however, you begin to make more and more of your own decisions in each of these areas. But because of your early programming, you are conditioned unconsciously to feel that someone else is still responsible for your life, that there's still someone else out there who can or should take care of you. Most people grow up believing that if something goes wrong, someone else is responsible, someone else is to blame, someone else is guilty, someone else is the villain, and they are the victim. As a result, most people make more and more excuses for the things in their lives, past and present, that make them unhappy. Get over the mistakes your parents made. If your parents criticized you or got angry with you for mistakes you made when you were growing up, you began to unconsciously assume that somehow you were at fault. If your parents have punished you physically or emotionally for doing or not doing something that pleased or displeased them, you felt inferior and inadequate. When your parents withheld their love to punish you for not doing something they demanded, you might have grown up with deep feelings of guilt, unworthiness, and undeservingness. All these negative feelings could then intersect to make you feel like a victim, like you are not responsible for yourself or your life. Once you became an adult, the most common feeling that we have as adults, if we have been raised in a critical home environment, is the feeling that I'm not good enough. Because of this feeling, we compare ourselves unfavorably to others. We think that other people who seem to be happier or more confident are better than us. We develop feelings of inferiority. This can become an emotional trap, the fatal fallacy. If we think for any reason that others are better than us, we unconsciously assume that we must be worse than they are. If they are worth more than we are, we assume that we must be worth less. This feeling of inadequacy or worthlessness lies at the root of most personality problems in our lives as well as most political and social problems in our world, both nationally and internationally. To escape from these feelings of guilt and worthlessness that have been instilled in us as a result of destructive criticism in childhood, we lash out at our world, other people, and situations in any part of our life with which we are unhappy or discontented. Our first reaction is to look around and ask, who's to blame? Two religions teach the concept of sin, which states that whenever something goes wrong, someone is to blame, someone has done something bad, someone is guilty, someone must be punished. This whole idea of guilt and punishment leads to ever-increasing feelings of anger, resentment, and irresponsibility. An attitude of irresponsibility fills our courts today, clogged with thousands of people demanding redress and payment for something that went wrong in their lives, backed up by ambitious plaintiff lawyers. People go to court demanding compensation even if they themselves are completely at fault for what happened, especially if they are at fault. People don't want to accept responsibility. People spill hot coffee on themselves and sue the fast food restaurant that sold them the coffee in the first place. People get drunk and drive off the road and then turn around and sue the manufacturer of the 15-year-old car they were driving. We'll climb up on a step ladder and lean over too far, falling to the ground, and then sue the ladder manufacturer for their injury. 
In each case, people were attempting to escape responsibility for their own behaviors by blaming someone else, making excuses, and then demanding compensation. Eliminating negative emotions. The common denominator of all people is the desire to be happy. In its simplest terms, happiness arises from the absence of negative emotions. Where there are no negative emotions, all that is left is positive emotions. Therefore, the elimination of negative emotions is your great business in life if you truly wish to be happy. There are dozens of negative emotions, although the most common are guilt, resentment, envy, jealousy, fear, and hostility. They all ultimately boil down to a feeling of anger directed either inward or outward. Anger is directed inwardly when you bottle it up rather than expressing it constructively to others. Anger is directed outwardly when you criticize or attack other people. Negative emotions are the major causes of psychosomatic illness. This occurs when the mind, psycho, makes the body so many sick. Negative emotions, especially as expressed in the form of anger, weaken your immune system and make you susceptible to colds, flu, and other diseases. Uncontrolled bursts of anger can actually bring about heart attacks, strokes, and nervous breakdowns. The fastest and most dependable way to eliminate negative emotions is to immediately say, I am responsible, whenever something happens that triggers anger or a negative reaction of any kind. Quickly neutralize the feelings of negativity by saying, I am responsible. The law of substitution says that you can substitute a positive thought for a negative one. Since your mind can only hold one thought at a time, when you deliberately choose the positive thought, I am responsible, you cancel out any other thought or emotion at that moment. It is not possible to accept responsibility and remain angry at the same time. It's not possible to accept responsibility and experience negative emotions. It's not possible to accept responsibility without becoming calm, clear, positive, and focused once more. As long as you are blaming someone else for something in your life that you don't like, you will remain a mental child, seeing yourself as small and helpless, like a victim, lashing out. However, when you begin to accept responsibility for everything that happens to you, you transform yourself into a mental adult, seeing yourself as being in charge of your own life, no longer a victim. In Alcoholics Anonymous, people who are having problems with drinking attend meetings with others going through the same situation. What they have found is that until the individual accepts responsibility for his or her problems, both the alcohol and in other areas of life, no progress is possible. But after the person accepts responsibility, everything is possible. This is true with almost every difficult situation in life in which you project your unhappiness onto other people or factors outside yourself. Money and Emotions Many of our biggest problems and concerns in life had to do with money. Earning it, spending it, investing it, and especially losing it. As a result, many of our negative emotions are associated with money in some way. However, the fact is that you are responsible for your financial life. You choose, you decide, you're in charge. You cannot blame your financial problems or situation on other people. You are in the driver's seat. So it is only when you accept responsibility for your income, your bills, and your investments that you can move from becoming an economic child to an economic adult. Responsibility and control. There's a direct relationship between the acceptance of responsibility and the amount of personal control you feel you have over your life. This means that the more you accept responsibility, the greater sense of control you experience. There's also a direct relationship between the amount of control you feel you have and how positive you feel. The more you feel that you have a high sense of control in the important areas of your life, the more positive and happy you are in everything you do. When you accept responsibility, you feel strong, powerful, and purposeful. Accepting responsibility eliminates the negative emotions that rob you of happiness and contentment in every situation. The antidote to negative emotions is to say, I am responsible, then look into the situation to find the reasons why you are responsible for what happened or for what is going on. Your intelligence is like a double-edged sword. You can use your intelligence to rationalize, justify, and blame other people for things you're not happy about. Or you can use your intelligence to find reasons why you are responsible for what happened and then take action to solve the problem or resolve the situation. You can make excuses, or you can make progress. You choose, even if an accident has occurred, such as your car being damaged in the parking lot while you're at work. You may not be legally at fault for the accident, but you are still responsible for your responses, for how you behave as a result of what happened. Never complain, never explain. 
The mark of the leader, the truly superior person, is that he or she accepts complete responsibility for the situation. It's not possible to imagine a true leader who whines and complains rather than taking action when problems and difficulties arise. This sense of responsibility is the mark of the highly developed personality. You take responsibility for your life by resolving in advance that you will not become upset or angry over something that you cannot affect or change. Just as you do not become angry about the weather, you do not become angry over circumstances and situations over which you have no control. Furthermore, you especially do not allow yourself to be angry and unhappy in the present because of unhappy experiences or situations from the past. You say, what cannot be cured must be endured. It's amazing how many people are unhappy today because of a past event, even something that happened many years ago. Each time they think of the negative experience, they become angry or depressed. Once more, the good news is that at any time, you can stop thinking about, discussing, and rehashing the past. You can let it go and begin thinking instead about your goals and your unlimited future. Any self-discipline, self-mastery, and self-control begin with taking responsibility for your emotions. You take charge of your emotions by accepting 100% responsibility for yourself and for your responses to everything that happens to you. You refuse to make excuses, complain, criticize, or blame other people for anything. Instead, you say, I am responsible, and then you take action of some kind. The only antidote is action. The only real antidote for anger or worry is purposeful action in the direction of your goals, which is the subject of the next chapter. Before you turn to that, however, resolve today to first take complete control of your thoughts, feelings, and actions, and then to get so busy working on things that are important to you that you don't have time to think about or express negative emotions to or about anyone for any reason. When you exert your self-discipline, self-mastery, and self-control in the acceptance of personal responsibility for your life, you take complete control of your thoughts and feelings. By doing so, you become a much more effective, happy, and positive person in everything you do. Our perception of the world is shaped by what psychologists call our interpretive style. This style is essentially the lens through which we interpret things to ourselves. If we alter this interpretation, our attitude towards everything changes. Additionally, every individual possesses a self-concept, akin to a thermostat, which functions as their operating system. Everything we manifest externally is influenced, modified, or affected in some way by our self-concept. Changing what's external requires a shift in our internal operating system. Our outward behavior always reflects our internal thoughts. The law of belief posits that our beliefs shape our realities. While these beliefs may not always align with objective truth, Intense belief can make them true for us. Similarly, the law of attraction suggests that we attract into our lives people and circumstances in harmony with our thoughts and expectations. Our expectations often manifest as self-fulfilling prophecies. Confident expectation is a hallmark of highly successful individuals. They expect to succeed more than they fail, consistently anticipating progress. Our expectations shape our realities. What we experience externally is determined by our internal thoughts. One of the most critical principles is challenging our self-limiting beliefs. We are often plagued by beliefs that falsely portray us as limited in some way. However, this isn't true at all. Ernest Holmes, the renowned metaphysician, once said that all negativity essentially stems from the frustration of potential. Nelson Mandela echoed this sentiment, emphasizing that our greatest problem lies not in feeling powerless, but in failing to recognize our immense power. Improvement in personal performance begins with enhancing our self-concept and beliefs about ourselves. Our self-concept predicts our levels of performance and effectiveness in everything we do. Our self-concept is subjective, influenced by the information we accept as real. It encompasses various aspects of our lives, and each of us harbors self-concepts for different areas. Notably, our self-concept regarding income is significant, often defining our comfort zone. Raising our financial thermostat involves challenging this self-concept level of income. It's pivotal to break free from compensatory behaviors and embrace positive change. Our self-concept comprises three main parts, the self-ideal, self-image, and self-esteem. Clarifying our goals and values, visualizing ourselves positively, and nurturing high self-esteem are essential components of personal growth. Overcoming fears of failure and rejection is paramount for high performance. 
The more we like ourselves, the less we fear failure and rejection. Positive self-talk and a constructive mindset play crucial roles in boosting self-esteem and reducing fears. Ultimately, striving for excellence reinforces and supports our self-esteem. Setting high goals creates a positive feedback loop, driving us toward success. Upgrading our self-esteem in every area of life is key to achieving extraordinary things. Uplifting others simultaneously uplifts ourselves, highlighting the interconnectedness of human relations. To achieve high performance, we must confront and overcome our fears of failure and rejection. Positive self-talk empowers us to think, feel, and act positively, elevating our self-esteem and diminishing our fears.